Dead Money is a DLC, and Fallout New Vegas known for being a bit of an annoyance to complete. With the toxic cloud looming around the resort, enough explosives to finally cure my headache, and the fact that it strips you of all of your possessions that you cling to like your life depends on it. All of that is to say that people often forget about it and all the cool equipment found within. One of these items happens to be the focus of this video. A unique 357 revolver, the police pistol has amazing damage, fast fire rate, and a great reload speed, so what's not to love? Given that dead money is often recommended for couriers who are level 20, it's often outshined by the weapons that are much easier to get, like Lucky and the Bison Steve, or even the renowned Ranger Sequoia. Since this video is titled the way that it is, and Owl is a femboy, not a female dog, that means that we'll have to find a way to get the police pistol without using any other weapon on very hard and hardcore. That incites the question of, can you beat Fallen to Vegas only using the police pistol? Starting off in Doc Mitchell's house of all places, I gave myself the first name that I could come up with, make the basic bottom with boobs, and selected my special stats. Intelligence and Luck were chosen for more skill points and a crit build respectively before going with Guns, Repair, and Survival for my tag skills. The two stars of the show, however, are built to destroy and fast shot. My go-to for most challenge runs is Logan's Loopold and Skilled, as I'm sure most of you longtime viewers are sick of hearing. But today we're going to spice things up a little bit, in exchange for a higher critical chance and faster fire rate. After building my character and talking to the bald guy, I pop on hardcore mode and loot his house. I won't be emptying my inventory for this run simply for the sake that nothing is really beneficial this time around, and I want to get the show on the road sooner rather than later because we've got a bit of a hike ahead of us. Heading over to Chet, I sell what goods I don't want before hitting the road. It's been almost three weeks since I've been back to Vegas, and boy does it feel good to be home. I say hey to Hidden Valley and Neil, sneak past the Indiana Jones boulder, check out the substation for any future endeavors in the area, and unironically head into Helios 1. That's right, bottoms, tops, switches, and asexuals. We're getting on that experience grind as a pacifist, because only a crazy person would tackle dead money at level 1. I grab the spherically shaped objects in the trousers of three men, Fantastic, Ignatio, and Malcolm Holmes of all people. What's strange is that I hadn't picked up a star bottle cap and he was just sitting there, menacingly, before I sparked up a conversation about him sneaking up on me. I kinda wonder if I just stumbled on the early game location of Malcolm Holmes, or if he was just in here visiting his boy toy Ignatio. Either way, I hit up the computers outside, barely dodge the turrets in the tower, grab a scrap metal, make some new friends that I will never see again much like real life, repair the generator, and send the power to the less privileged areas. You can't say that I've never done anything nice in my life. Ignatio seems pleased and he hands me my glasses back so that I could level up for more survival and rapid reload. Next up is hanging out with the kings, but before that I grab the combat armor at the wreck caravan and visit Fisto's supplier for tools for his profession. I learned my lesson by this point that if you wait until daytime, you can completely avoid having to go upstairs to talk with the king. Owl is finally becoming big brain, so I hope that you guys are as proud of me as I am of you. The king of course sends me to talk with Oris, and I uncover with my insane detective abilities that he's a fraud before going through the familiar loop of talking with a man who likes peanut butter and robotic dogs, this cute age-gapped couple, Rex's voluptuous rear end, that one girl who went to one rave in high school and hasn't achieved anything since, a man's rather tight prison wallet, my future lover who will finally be okay with me owning a fursuit, my dead grandma's idol in life, a sexy dominant furry, and ultimately back to the king himself. I'll be honest, I don't even want to proofread any of that and leave that for future me to figure out. Good luck, Owl. Levels 3 through 5 see more survival, speech, and the best perk ever. I hope to one day create a company that sells condoms that somehow uses Radchild and its advertising or labeling, but until then we are off to Boulder City for more experience. Here I further increase my speech and repair before going with Gunslinger. I'm really not sure if this perk actually does anything, but now I am because I just googled it and found out that it increases accuracy by 25%, thus counteracting fast shot anytime I use it in VATS. The more you know. After talking with Jessup and leveling up to level 7, I grab more repair and make my way to the boomers. If you guys seriously thought that Owl was going to make a video where it follows a linear path and didn't jump all over the place, you thought wrong. Getting past the bombardment with only a scrape of health left, I do the dance of talking with Raquel before trying to do some of their quests. Unfortunately, you need reputation with the boomers to do the quest for Jack, so I got mildly upset, took a sip of water because I have healthier coping mechanisms than me in middle school, grabbed my caps from George, and grabbed the Brotherhood's mission statements outside of Nellis and the irradiated butthole near Black Mountain. Originally I was just going to whip into Repcon headquarters and grab the one inside, but after finding out that my science skill wasn't high enough, 
I had to fling myself through the wall so many times that I seriously contemplated shutting off my constant stream of research just so I could use both hands. Despite all odds, I persisted, reloaded my game to stop the lag after quick saving and quick loading a thousand times, grabbed the final mission statement, sold some stuff to the arms merchant at the 188, and played a game of Smash or Pass with the radio. All of that nonsense allowed me to be welcomed into the Brotherhood, do essentially the same nonsense with people that weren't dead, and talk with Lorenzo. By now you're probably thinking to yourself, Owl, when are you going to get the police pistol? The answer is when I feel like it. Heading up to Repcon, walking past all of the ghouls, and grabbing any stealth boy I could get my hands on, I anger Jason by just existing, clarifying that he is in fact racist. If you ever needed proof that people change based on who was around them, I think this is it. The second time around, I end up being his homie or whatever, so I talk with Davison, learn that the drugs that he is looking for aren't currently in stock on Amazon, meet a super chill feral ghoul, make out with Jason while wearing socks, so I'm not gay, buy some parts from old Lady Gibson, find out that my son from the last dozen runs grew up to believe in radiation like his dad, and watch the rockets go burr. Owl, what about the Brotherhood quest? I yearn to find out how you overcome such delicate precision without a thumb, you dummy thick owl. Relax, my child. The time is now. Vault 11 is relatively straightforward if you know where you're going, or are obnoxiously persistent like yours truly. So we'll skip to the two that you were actually curious about. Thomas Hildren and Kent McCarran gives us another quest we can do while we're in the same area, so I bravely head out and into the waste with such bravery that the bravest man or woman of the bravest race known only as Humans the Brave and pop into Vault 21. Better remembered as Vault 22 thanks to the internet. Snagging the keycard, opening the door to the caverns, grabbing the filters for the Brotherhood, taking a gander at a massive collection of research, discovering Red Rock Canyon, flirting with Diane while she wears something I want my body pillow to be able to pull off, walking to Cottonwood Cove, bring one of Kaisar's pleasure slaves, talking with Thomas Hildren and reassuring you the viewer that no, these clips aren't out of order, taking a lovely walk through a nice part of town, dropping off the goods to Motor Runner and grabbing the final part for the Brotherhood allows me to return to Diane for some caps and Lorenzo so that he can finally make the doll that I showed him from an old magazine with sticky pages. Now at level 9, I was feeling pretty good about myself, but I still wanted to be able to say that I was part of the Brotherhood for some inexplicable reason. Popping some Mentats allows me to free Rhonda, thus completing the crazy 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 quest and saving Raul. How after all these years Vega still somehow manages to make the same fetch quest fun, I don't know. But all those tribulations gets us to level 10, the finesse perk, and a membership to a pretty decent gym. Hey. You there. Chances are if you made it to this point in the video, you happen to like my content and think I'm pretty cute. If that's the case and you'd like to support my content, please consider checking out the channel's Patreon. You can get ad-free videos early and a special role in the channel's Discord. Thanks, cutie. We haven't had the opportunity to do dead money on the channel for over 225 days, which is quite a lot because I've basically joined the group of YouTubers who do nothing but fall into Vegas. But that all changes today as we smell the cutest boy's fart and get to work creating our own team of Avengers. Stealing some wishes from the fountain and disabling some radios in the police station, I finally get what I've always wanted. Happiness, a loving family, a stable income, to be good at art, a hot and healthy body, Wolverine's hair, and a golf club that has my name on it. I don't even play golf. The police pistol in my possession, my new goal was to somehow make this weapon as powerful as I can make it without spending 50 hours on this playthrough. But first, we need to get through dead money. Getting God out of his cage and into a smaller one with some convincing, I grab more guns and see how this bad boy behaves. It's no surprise that it will kill, but we're going to be putting it through a lot over the next few hours of gameplay, so we need to make sure that it is more reliable than me at disarming traps or holding small children. Sitting down with Dean and having a delightful conversation, I find out that God is actually looking really depressed. Me being the good friend that I am, I push on into the medical wing and try to encourage him to regenerate his health. Unfortunately, because he is lame, he doesn't, and I'm forced to send him back to the fountain and face these trials alone. The trials I speak of are running past a guard who doesn't actually have a body, opening a desk or a key, hitting a button on a computer, and meeting Christine. I actually really love this character, so at some point I will need to come back here just to play with her hair, and not the kind that she has on her head. Father Elijah, that's who's running this whole show for those who are as lost as my hope to one day settle down and have kids of my own. I just want someone to hold me and tell me everything is going to be okay but instead we've got to deal with this stupid crap. Because God is weak like me anytime feeder mentioned, I have to baby him until he grows up to be the big strong boy I know he can be. I encourage him to grow up really fast like my parents did to me, 
And as I watch him rip apart a ghost and eat his first piece of human flesh, I feel the fatherly bond we've created. A few more kills later, both of ghosts and alarms, I deposit more flesh into Dog's prison wallet before hitting up Dean for his autograph. He refuses. I know this might be surprising for some of you, but I did actually run into an issue in this challenge run. Shocking, I know. Not having 357 rounds while in this DLC made things a little tricky, but upon another visit to the internet, specifically one to the section that talks about the vendors and dead money, it was revealed to me that I could get the code for the ammo I needed if I could just get past this door. Unfortunately, my science wasn't high enough, so I banked on the potential of leveling up and finding a programming book for more science. Back on the grind through this hot mess of a tasty playthrough, I activate a few holograms and give Dean a handy so that he feels relieved and confident. Christine was delighted to see me so that we could pick right up where we left off. I repair the circuit breaker, shoot a few things that hurt my ear holes more than any genitalia has hurt them before, grab a key from a locker, do some research on sites that aren't appropriate for all viewers, and realize suddenly that I only have one bullet left. After not leveling up enough to get to 75 science or finding a skill book and some mentats, I go back to the police station and spend 5 minutes glitching through this door. I absolutely hate doing this, not because of the cheating aspect, but because of the fact that it is unironically faster than me hacking the terminal itself. Getting inside the room fills me with such delight that I have to change my Facebook status to married because you guessed it, my love-hate relationship with this game has changed from hate to love for the 69th time. Finally having ammo after spending all of my chips at the vendor, I go on a bit of a killing spree that makes my nipples just a little bit hard before starting the main event. Inside I find my friends unconscious and have to spend 15 minutes trying to figure out how to disable the security measures so that I could turn on the power, gamble my way to happiness better than I have since my girlfriend left me, and buy all the doctor's bags I could ever want. Dog is unhappy to see that I'm happy, so I foil his plans for a Thanksgiving turkey and take him out with the, you guessed it, police pistol, before heading over to the theater where Dean is reliving his glory days and consuming alcoholic beverages. I've told him multiple times that alcohol is bad for his complexion, but like that friend who has tried to quit drinking more times than the number of buttons on my TI-83 Plus that carry me through AP Calculus has, the only thing I could really do is play a movie and tell him to look at the roses. After some more shenanigans in the library with one of those luggage carts and a skateboard, I walk mindlessly through the hotel rooms upstairs and talk with Christine, who has looked up on the internet how to speak. I'm glad that she's taking the time to learn my language, it's very polite of her. Walking through the death trap again and grabbing the audio clips from the desk because I know the plot and care about it a great deal more than the nail of my pinky toe which was ripped off this morning when I caught it on the door of my non-existent Lamborghini. Regardless, this next segment is just going to be me getting out of dead money, so I'd like to talk about a difficult time in my life that I had to get out of. We were on the beach, still respecting my distance from the massive hole of darkness that I like to think of as the ocean. It was a nice day, perhaps a little bit too overcast for sun tanning, but that wasn't what we were there for. I admired her well-built body, her legs looked like they could suffocate me without any effort on her part, and her shoulders were large enough that they could shove me up against a wall. She certainly did both, but today we had a different kind of fun planned. Her sundress flowed smoothly up her legs, but up a little bit higher you could see straps through the thin fabric as well as the star of the show. For some time we sat on the blanket with light blue straps that we had brought to the secluded beach to enjoy each other's company and the waves. But when she had felt that the timing was right, we walked over to the collection of rocks that she had picked out. It was a rather beautiful spot that almost formed a half of a crater, like a lighthouse sat on top of it and fell down into the waters below. I was slightly scared, but the water had recessed enough that we had plenty of space to pick a spot to get to work. I took the striped towel we had brought with us, set it down on a patch of sand, and we proceeded to warm up. I could feel its wonderful texture even through her dress and it made me grow rather excited in more ways than one. It wasn't long after getting down on all fours that I was satisfied, but in our enjoyment the water had risen past the point where we could get back to the other side of the stone wall. We were forced to look around for a little bit, hiking around the rocks, trying to find a break in the wall. If you've ever been in a similar situation with a woman with an extra appendage, you'll know that it is an absolutely beautiful sight watching it bounce in a thin sundress. After roughly half an hour, I had found a point that looked like we could climb up, but the rocks were slick and we need to be careful. Me being the more experienced in climbing, I took the lead, scoping out good holds as she trailed behind. Eventually, with persistence, we climbed to the top and felt the beautiful sense of freedom that was the resort. After escaping the vault and grabbing the handloader perk, I spent a lot of time and ships buying more ammo and converting it to magnum rounds before getting to the strip. 
I was here to fulfill my vendetta first and foremost, but also to buy some chems from Gamora. Heading towards the tops, convincing Swank to isolate Benny, decorating his apartment with some of his guts, saying hey to the Pez dispenser, getting to the fort, and saying hey to Kaiser, I get to work on doing his quest for the sake of leveling up. Mr. House, of course, is saddened by the loss of a potential femboy, but the robots in the bunker really didn't stand much of a chance. This pistol is highly accurate, making it a dream for a player who likes being away from their enemies to avoid getting hurt. After taking care of the generators and a few more robots littered around the place, I head back to Kaiser before being told to kill Mr. House. The Securitrons in the Lucky 38 were definitely pretty tough in the sense that they took more bullets, but other than that, it was a cakewalk. Mr. House and his sexy skin bag dies before I return to Kaiser and eliminate the boomers. You'll quickly find out that at this point I grew increasingly violent now that I have a weapon that I can use, but Kaiser seems happy enough that he does his little dance. Even old Ben seems to agree with my methods as I unload all of my juices into his face. If you are a long time viewer of the channel, you know that I have always struggled with dealing with the Ultralux. This time around is no exception, even after spending another half an hour running around trying to tackle this group of cannibals. So I just reload a save, talk to Mortimer, and get back to Kaiser. One day I'll figure it out, but it won't be today, because we've got the Brotherhood to take down. Grab the key cards from all the important people, hacking into the mainframe like they do in the Matrix, and heading back to Kaiser makes him a little too happy, so he starts to talk about his erectile dysfunction issues. Me being the nice guy that I'm not, I take down some golden geckos before leveling up and doing some math. By increasing my explosives to 30 and grabbing comprehension, I could use one of the magazines I got from Dead Money to talk to Severus and to just making the Legion like me. Considering that I had no actual plans of siding with Legion, this works out perfectly, and I just grab the key from Lucius, allowing me to get the Lucky Shades. The things I do to build my characters are kind of comical at this point, but extra critical chance isn't something I feel like passing up. Next thing we need is caps, and a lot of them, so hanging out with Sunny and Trudy puts me on the path to meeting Ringo. Because the NCR hates us, he shoots on sight, but I'm able to get what we really came here for once I'm done smelling his armpits. The deck of caravan cards. I actually had a lot of fun playing caravan again, but I was a little bit rusty considering that out of the 12 games I played, he did manage to beat me once. Now with enough caps to finally make my ex-girlfriend come back to me, I talked to Dr. Usain Bolt for any implants that I could get my hands on, and some additional medical supplies. The last DLC we're going to be doing for this run is Honest Hearts. While Lonesome Row technically gives you better gear for a crit build with Morgan Freeman's Duster, I really don't feel like playing that DLC again right now. Instead, we listen to some dialogue, kill some white legs, and meet Fallishjock. We've checked out this DLC a few times already in the last few videos, and we're really only here for one thing, so let's get a little groovy, shall we? Graham sends us on a wild goose chase for a compass, walkie-talkies, a medical supply kit, and lunch boxes before Daniel has us grab the map to the Grand Staircase, kill a bunch of white legs, and grab their standards. This allows me to level up and grab better criticals, which will allow us to do even more damage. I carry on with some more killing, explosive placing, and murdering a bunch of Yaogwai. After a conversation with Daniel and the murder of a crap ton of white legs, I let Graham kill salt upon wounds before grabbing more critical hit chance in two ways. The first is found within the Percolite Touch, and the second is found within Graham's armor that you obtain at the end of the DLC. After all that murder and a lot of playtime, we are looking pretty stacked. While I know I haven't built a perfect character, we now have a substantial amount of critical chance and damage. To put everything to the test, I go on a massive murder spree and try to find contentment within the police pistol. Once upon a time, there was a young man named Cog who lived in a wasteland. The wasteland was a barren, desolate place where nothing grew and the air was thick with dust and ash. Cog had grown up in the wasteland and had never known any other way of life. He spent his days scavenging for food and water constantly on the move to avoid the dangers that lurked around every corner. One day, as Cog was wandering through the wasteland, he came across a wise old owl perched atop a withered tree. The owl had a serene look on his face, and Cog couldn't help but feel drawn to it. He approached the owl and asked, How do you find peace in this wasteland? The owl looked at Cog with its wise, knowing eyes and said, Peace is not something you find, it is something you create. Look around you, Cog. The wasteland may be a harsh and unforgiving place, but there is beauty to be found if you know where to look. Cog was skeptical, but the owl urged him to look closer. He began to notice small pockets of greenery, tiny flowers struggling to survive in the cracked earth, and the occasional glimpse of wildlife. Slowly but surely, Cog began to see the wasteland in a new light. He started to appreciate the small things and found joy in the simplest of pleasures. Cog started to make his own little home, 
a place where he could rest and feel safe. He helped others find happiness and even started to share his food and water with those in need. Then one day, Kong found the wise old owl perched atop a withered tree. This time, however, the owl had a look of sadness on its face. The owl was tired of creating his own peace, tired of fighting for every meal, and tired of not having a home. Kong, seeing that the owl needed to be cared for, reached out with loving, gentle arms. He fed, watered, and gave the owl a place to rest. A place to once again find happiness. But happiness is not what we're striving for in this run. We are striving for destruction. Returning to DS Man after powering the substation, we start the final battle of Hoover Dam. Overall, this build is relatively solid. The survivability is decent without any main resistant perks outside of toughness and a poor selection of chems, but the damage is definitely a mixed bag. On one hand, the police pistol can do a lot of damage on headshots and criticals, but it hits like a pillow without those factors. If you can hit your shots, this setup works well in vats and over long distances, but it really is the luck of a draw if an encounter goes in your favor. With a few chems like rushing water and turbo, you can absolutely destroy all of your enemies, despite this being a relatively mediocre gun. Keep in mind that the difficulty I played on is very hard, so at easier difficulties this gun would have no troubles being a valuable component of a courier's arsenal. At only 3 pounds and a massive damage potential, I definitely wouldn't mind grabbing it on my next playthrough. The Legate without any great chems or methods of stun locking definitely didn't go very smoothly. Lanius himself wasn't the problem, it was, like usual, all of his men that slowed me down and made things a little tricky. After several attempts, I managed to take him down before dealing with the last few enemies and heroically facing General Oliver proving that yes, you can beat Fallout in Vegas only using the police pistol. If you like this video, consider smacking that like button wider than Frosty the Snowman's type of donk donk and consider checking out my other goodies here. With all that out of the way, I've been Owl, but do me a favor, will ya? Have a good one.